from thatching to stonemasonry or metalwork, Britain's master craftsmen were central to every aspect of life. Down the centuries, their workmanship has defined the fabric of this country, from the grandest cathedral to the simplest of tools. Iron Age man, every time it made an iron instrument, they had to do this. Yeah. There are still guardians of these crafts working today, who are dedicated to taking the long tradition of these skills into our modern world. I'm going to rotate it round, keeping the bevel on the work. In this series, complete beginners with a genuine passion to learn will be given an intensive introduction by some of these experts. You need to get that power into it, rather than tickling it. But can a complete novice master even the basic elements of the craft in a short space of time, however intensive? You go through hell trying to get it right, and then all of a sudden, one morning, it'll just click. And will they have acquired the skills to make something that is both beautiful and useful? I amazed myself. And I kept looking at it and thinking, did I do that? I can feel myself getting excited already because actually blacksmithing is something that I've always wanted to do more of. I've seen a bit of it, I've tried it, and I used to work with silver years ago, and I love the way that silver responds to being beaten with a hammer and then it moves and changes and you can shape it. And there is something magical about the way that with blacksmithing, you take molten metal, this very elemental, raw material, and then with skill and a lot of energy, turn it into objects that are useful and domestic and intimate. The blacksmith craft was once essential to almost every tool or implement conceivable. And for centuries, the local smithy played a pivotal role in every community. Don Barker has been a blacksmith for over 30 years. He's a master craftsman and has made ironwork for the royal family, Westminster Abbey and St Paul's Cathedral. And blacksmithing is in his blood, with both sides of his family working in the trade for the past 300 years. And it's here, in this forge taken over especially for this project, that Don will teach three beginners the elements of his craft. Well, there it is, the blacksmith forge here in South Ferriby on Humberside. And this low, fairly dilapidated building is right on a busy road, surrounded by buildings. And that's how blacksmiths always were. In fact, that one's been there for hundreds of years. Because blacksmiths didn't just do a specialist job stuck away on the equivalent of an industrial estate. They were the hub of the community around everything else revolved. Everything that needed a metal tool of some kind, every metal component from a nail to a spigot, had to come from the blacksmith. Hello. Hello. Be with you in a minute. Just a sec. Morning. Good morning. You must be Don. I'm Don Barker, yes. How do you do? Pleased to meet you. And you. I mean, in day-to-day -day life, now, do we need blacksmiths? Is it an indulgence? We do, yeah. What for? Well, there are things that can't be done by anybody else, really, and mainly making quality gates, making quality ironwork, would a, a beautifully made gate be ridiculously expensive or would it be within the reach of, of well, most people? Well, it depends people? how you look at it. Yeah. The most expensive gate that I've ever made was £50,000. That's quite a lot of money. Which is a bit out of the range yeah. of the majority of people. But then we've made beautiful gates for £800. In a very short while, you're going to have three people turning up. No idea what they're going to be like. That should be fun. What will you look for? What will you look for in that first um, day? First of all, they need to be enthusiastic and they need to be wanting to have a go. Yeah. Secondly, they need to have a sort of innate ability for hand-eye coordination. And how long will it take for you to work out whether they'll be any good or not? Uh, about an hour. No. Yeah. Our three would-be blacksmiths each have their own particular reasons for wanting to learn this craft. Dominic Branch comes from London. He's done a variety of different jobs and is currently a part-time market trader. Morning, more. He's always mind. loved metal and is hoping that the craft of blacksmithing is the key to a better life. Uh, these are implants. Um, I make a, a small incision 
Uh, they feed it through, there's a little ball on the end, and then the flesh just tightens up around them. Everyone's got a, a passion for certain things, but I like metal. I, I like the way it shines, I like the feel. It's manly. <laughs> it's really manly. At the moment, I'm working in Camden on the market stalls. Good morning. Morning, sweetheart. If I had the skills of a blacksmith, I'd be able to generate my own little pieces of art that I can talk to the, the wanting public. I mean, how nice would that be? Nice? Yes. <laughs> I want to wake up in the morning, look forward to going to work. I don't want to wake up and dread it. I want to go in and enjoy my day. Hugh Gallagher has recently returned from Spain to start a new life following the breakdown of his marriage. I have a son of, uh, of 11 and I have a daughter of three. My son understands why I'm here. Every time I speak to my daughter, she says, well, I'm going to come on home tonight. Like that breaks my heart. Hugh is an architectural illustrator, but hopes an intensive course in blacksmithing will rekindle a passion for sculpting in metal, which he briefly but impressively pursued as a teenager. This one here is the first one I ever produced. Uh, it's, a, um, it's a cross of our Lord. We have this one, which is the, the second one I ever made in metalwork. I think I was 16 or 17 when I did this one. To pursue uh, something that I, that, that I enjoyed doing so much when, uh, in my younger years, it's given me a new energy. Jill Fewing works as a part-time museum educator and also looks after her elderly aunt and mother. Her grandfather was a blacksmith and she wants to see if his smithing genes have been passed on to her. I come from a line of quite creative people. My grandfather could make things and build things. My dad, my grandmother, my mother can all do stuff. And you come to me and you think, I don't know if I can. Now is the time to try and find out whether I can really do something or not. I am just about still fit enough, and my family are still well enough for me to have time to try. So the doorway to step through is now. It takes an apprentice four to five years to qualify as a blacksmith. These three have just six weeks to master the basics of the craft from managing the furnace to forging metal into objects that are both useful and beautiful. At the end of the six weeks, they'll be judged on a final project, and the winner of that will have the opportunity to go on and work alongside professional blacksmiths on the restoration of a prestigious National Trust project. Hello. How are you doing? I'm Monty. Dominic, pleased to meet you. Dominic, hello. Chill. Yeah. Right. Hugh. Hugh. OK, fine. We're here. We're coming around the corner. But that is a long way ahead. And according to Don, if they lack basic hand-eye coordination, they're going to fall at the first hurdle. This is Don, who is going to be teaching you everything he can. Well, I think the best thing to do is to learn to make something very basic, which is a nail, which is something that around Birmingham area was done day after day after day. When they'd done the quota, they could go home. What was the quota per day? Uh, well, I think for a decent-sized nail, it was 60 an hour. I want you to make the standard nail I'm going to show you. I want you to make 10 an hour, and that will prove to me whether you've got the potential and capability of becoming a blacksmith. Controlling the temperature of the metal is the key to blacksmithing. If it's too cold, the metal won't be pliable enough to work. But if it gets too hot, it then burns and turns brittle once it's cooled down. So basically, we're going to put a taper on this. I turn it every 90 degrees, keep it square. And so we don't lose it, we can break it off like that. And then we're going to put it in there and forge the head out of what sticks out. In under 60 seconds, a few judiciously aimed blows transform an iron rod into a nail. So that's basically the principle of the thing. Now they've seen how to do it, the trainees have a go. Move further onto your anvil there. OK, and so I hit it about... Oh, anywhere, I, I hit, can make it more tapered. Do the point first. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And then when you've got a point on it, work back. That's it. Not in the four square, it's going round. Yeah, you're pushing hammer stuff, right? 
And aren't you finding it strange and sort of uncomfortable? It's a hell of a lot harder than it looks. You think a simple nail, but everything from how you hold the tongs, even, I find holding the tongs quite awkward. Yeah, I need to get more of the... You've and got then... to be confident. I mean, that's yeah. the thing. I'm quite surprised you've thrown him in the deep end with this. It really is. OK, here's a blue right, I just yeah. do it. The thing about it is that each of these processes is a very simple blacksmithing process. You right. put it all together, you've got a nail. Yeah. yeah. Mm. How's that feeling? Excellent, thank you. But every time you hit it, for every one good one, there's three bad ones right. that you've got to put right. 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 And that's the scary bit. This is Dominic's third. That's Hugh's second, and Jill has made one, almost. Damn it. You see that happening. Rats. Mm, don't do this. <laughs> After an hour of energetic nail making, it's time to down tools. OK, folks, hammer's down, and we'll have a look at what's uh, been done. Dominic's nails are the first to be scrutinised. Right, here we've got two, four, six, seven nails, good squares. The heads are a little bit iffy, but that's the most difficult part. So, well done. Excellent. Next, Hugh. Mm. Not quite as pretty as they might be, but nevertheless, you've done very well. I think that's great. Lovely. And lastly, Jill. Right, here we've got... Really well-shaped nails, good square taper. Heads could need a bit more work on them. But I'd like to say that I think you've done really well. I'm very pleased. And, uh, <laughs> strangely enough, I think you've all got potential. I was good. hoping that... It's the beginning. Great. And now the final test. Do they do the job they're designed for? One of the sort of absolutely essentials of any piece of craft work is it's got to do the function for which it was Absolutely, made. Absolutely, yes. No matter what it looks like... That's the whole we... point of the exercise, yeah, really. Yeah, it's got yeah. to do it. Yeah. yeah. Right, they go into the stretcher, which is this bit here. Does that look good, or does that look good? I think it looks good. Right, next go on. one, please. That's it. Beautiful. Oh, that's fantastic. Is it, is Absolutely it a nail brilliant. or is it a wedge? Is it's that a nail. good or what? No, it's <laughs> Do you and actually, purpose? They're, they're very, very beautiful objects. You've pitched up, you've worked metal, you've made an object that has a finite end, and you've used the object. I think that's a very, very satisfactory start. If I were you, I'd be pleased. I mean, I was fairly confident that knowing that I'm going to be able to do it, but, yeah, you've always got to have that fear in your back, you know, back of your mind. Will I be able to do it? Won't I be able to do it? How hard is it going to be? No one likes to walk away and admit defeat, especially me. Today was really good. I enjoyed it. But I'm concerned I'm going to hold the others back if I'm not quick enough on what I do. And if I speed up too much, I'm not going to have the strength to get everything done that I want to do. Now we have so much to learn. It's just amazing how much it takes to do a nail. But uh, after your first... Uh second or third attempt, you feel like you're actually achieving something, you're actually learning the, the skill itself. They've all passed Don's initial test, but making nails is just the beginning. Every apprentice will master a few basic skills in the forge very early on. And one of the first that they have to do is a scroll, which is taking a bar of metal and learning to heat it and hammer it into this beautiful, fluid scroll. Now, the art of that is partly just turning the metal, but the really important thing is to get a sinuous curve. It looks simple, it's quite tricky, but it's absolutely essential. But before they can get started, they must learn how to control the blacksmith's most important ally, the forge, which should burn at a constant 1,200 degrees. In order to manage the fire properly, you need to have Coal black on the top so it doesn't heat you mm -hmm. and it keeps the heat into the fire. Yeah. When you put the bar into the fire, if you put it in slowly, it pushes the fire out of place like that. So you need to push it in quickly so that it punches a hole yeah. in the actual fire mound and it doesn't damage it. And the better you can keep that nucleus of the fire, 
the, the hot of the fire will be in a small area. The temperature you need to work out for this is between yellow and down to dark red. So if you see white sparks in the fire, it's because your, your metal's burning away inside there. It's in there. That's too hot for what we're doing. Firecracker. So don't get it as hot as that, and you'll be fine. There are lots of different types of scroll, but this one's called a fishtail scroll. And the reason it's called a fishtail scroll is because it starts off looking like the tail of a fish. After first forging an even taper, Don then uses the edge of the anvil to begin turning the scroll. Coaxing the iron into the required shape calls for extreme precision in the control of both hammer and anvil. This is always the most important part of a scroll centre. If you start off with it right, you're starting as you should mean to go on. Scroll making dates back as far as the 13th century and it's still the most common form of a blacksmith's decorative work. Not brute strength, gentle. Blacksmithing is gentle. It's a hard, aggressive material, but we're trying to put beauty into it, you know? There we are, there we have a scroll. Took about two to three minutes to do that. So that's what you've got to try and attempt to do. It's a difficult one to do. And this is only day two. This is day two. Right. What's it going to be like in a few weeks? They must learn to control the temperature, which is in the metal. So it must be consistent to get the curve, the gentle curve of the scroll perfectly proportionate to the middle of the scroll. That's just like a piece of plasticine when it's hot. Yeah, yeah. And you're just cajoling it to do what you want it to do. Feeling like a real worker and an artist in the same patch, like, you know? I'm taking a straight piece of metal and I'm shaping it, bending it, manipulating it to suit what I need to. You have to actually be gentle, but at the same time, be firm. But it's very enjoyable. It's great. Hit it harder. Rather than tickling. Yep. Jill's having a bit of a problem with strength. She's having to use a smaller hammer than everybody else. And so, consequently, she's taking longer to do the task simply because she's not using a heavier hammer. And she's frightened of getting the stuff as hot as it needs to be. Today, I can't get it right, but that's going to happen. It's not nice, I don't like it, but I'll, get, I'll live with it until I come out the other side. Better at it. So I want more confidence, more aggression, all right? Yes, I am enjoying it very much, but I'll enjoy it more when I get it right. Now it's time to see if any of them have got it right. Dominic, this one here, you've got a flat on it there. You've got a nice tight scroll in the middle. If you look at that side, that's actually quite good. Yeah. So you've, you've just not got the consistency through the scroll to the other side. You. That's a little bit uneven. Nope. And the tight's a little... The, the centre's a little bit too tight. It comes in a bit too much there, as you can see. But quite good. Jill, you've got the edges right, but the middle's a bit bulgy. Yeah. But you've all got, potentially, quite a good result. Um, so... Well done. There is only one way to master any craft, and that is dogged perseverance. For every one hit that goes in the right place, there are two that go in the wrong. You've got to keep your eye on this one. And over the next few days, the trainees try their hand at all manner of scrolls, from fishtails to beveled and halfpenny snubs. We've got an extremely thin neck to it. Neck to it. I think the best thing you can do is cut it off about there and we'll start again. Take four. <laughs> None of them are finding it easy. Who can make the most fresh starts? That's what it is. I think you have to get used to the fact that you're not getting it right the first time. Or perhaps even the second time. Or perhaps even the third time. <laughs> That's it. Ah. Don't do any more. It's a good effort, is that? You can see the difference now. Yeah and the skills that's required to actually be a blacksmith. Yeah. I'm a lot happier. It's given me my humour, my sense of humour back again, which I lost. I wasn't like that before. Working on a computer station day in, day out tends to narrow your, your perspective. This, because it's almost like metal expanding, it expands your perspective. 
And as the first week draws to an end, Hugh's work is making quite an impression. This is the scroll that Hugh produced, which is almost identical to the one that I produced. Hugh has done a fantastic job in producing this one, which I would say would pass muster any day of the week. Whilst the trainees continue to wrestle with scrolls and hammers and extreme heat, I'm off to Bristol to see Brunel's SS Great Britain. An iron ship that was forged on the crest of the molten wave of the Industrial Revolution. It's an extraordinary thought, but Brunel's SS Great Britain, at its time the, the largest metal steamship in the world, was made in blacksmith shops. The plates were forged by steam hammers by blacksmiths. And it captures that moment when the Industrial Revolution took the blacksmith's art and used it to build this enormous empire of commerce. I'm meeting Shane Casey, a marine archaeologist, to learn how the traditional blacksmiths realised Brunel's revolutionary concept. The iron plates would have been rolled to specific uh, thicknesses and shipped down to Bristol in generally uh, six foot by two foot lengths. Meanwhile, the Great Western Steamship Company had erected a massive factory and there they would have heated the plates up and then forged them to the desired curvature of the hull. So you're implying that every plate was done as an individual unit? Yes. Everyone was made to fit? Yes, yes. The ship weighs 3,500 tonnes and took more than 300 people over four years to build. Well, here, Monty, you can yeah. see the structure of the ship. The whole thing is held together by hundreds of thousands of rivets. Each rivet made by hand mm -hmm. and put in by hand. Requiring absolute precision, speed, teamwork, and an eye for exactly how hot the rivet was. What you've just described is a blacksmith's craft, isn't it? Precision, Absolutely. speed, an eye for heat, yes. understanding yes. the metal, times lots of hundreds of thousands. For four continuous years. Well, you get good at it, wouldn't you? Back at the forge, the trainees are now in their second week, and Don wants to move them on to making a finished product. Morning. Morning. Morning, morning. Morning, morning. morning. The start of a new project, part of the skill of a blacksmith is to actually make something to a drawing or to an example and replicate it yeah. so that it's exactly the same. So what we're going to do is we're going to make ten of these yeah. and they've got to be done by Friday. Oh, thank God, I thought you were saying lunchtime. OK. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that one, you take that one and Don will take that one and we'll finish the last one off. Well done. All right. What do you think? Yeah. Making ten flambeaux all precisely the same will employ the forging and scrolling skills that they've learned so far, as well as introducing them to some new ones. Keep that at the right angle. Wrapping their scrolls around the jig allows them to duplicate the flambeau basket exactly. Do like that. Look at that. There we've got our first basket. That is awesome. Hey, Joe. Yeah. What do you reckon of that? Oh, well done, that man. Are you impressed, that man? Absolutely. Who oh, wouldn't be? So I think it's Krantz. <laughs> 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 you should do it again. <laughs> the thing is, I will be doing it again and again. It might be repetitive, but Dominic seems to be in his element. I love it. I thought I was going to be learning some skills. I didn't realise I was going to feel so passionate about this. And I'm absolutely revelling in it. <laughs> However, despite having won Don's early approval, Hugh's determination to get everything perfect is beginning to go against him. Hugh will mess about on a, a simple detail rather than just getting on with the job, and it's really frustrating and irritating to watch him do that, because you see, just bloody get on with it, you know? Whoa, 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 it's got to be scrapped, that one. You just left it in a bit too long. Despite Jill's blacksmithing genes, it still isn't coming naturally. She, she, first of all, doesn't get the bar very hot in the fire. And secondly, when she takes it out, she spends a lot of time thinking about it, looking at it. So by the time she's decided where to hit it, it's cold and it has to go back in the fire. The idea is to strike while the iron's hot, as we all know. I have never been so bad at something and enjoyed the process so much. So far, the trainees have tried hard to follow the aim of the task, which is accurate replication. But when it comes to making the last few flambeaux, 
Hugh can't resist taking a bit of artistic license. That's not bad. Is that where you want it bending in? Yeah, we want it bending in that way. If somebody came into your forge and said, I want ten of these, yeah. that's what they'd want, ten of those. Not ten redesigned to your own design. Now all that remains is the final stage of the process, which is to rivet the components together. Okay. Numero uno. Line left. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just have a look at what we've got here. <laughs> First of all, the thing that strikes me most is that if you put the scrolls facing you and then look at the difference in the bends at the bottom, this is how it should be, that's how it shouldn't be. So that's wrong. But the worst effect we've got here is the fact that that has only got two twists on it. The template had three. The importance of keeping the things all the same has been allowed to go to the wall a bit. Yeah. For me, it was a bit of a challenge because I prefer more artistic flair when I'm doing something. And it was difficult for me to actually stick to the brief, like start putting in an extra scroll and say, well, that's nicer and that's better than the, the clients and we'll go with that. You know, you can't do that. Not with this type of exercise. Don's organized a bonfire party and has invited some of his fellow smiths along. There's the lads. Hey, how Hello. you doing? Hi, guys. Hiya. 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 How you doing? Dominic. You all right? Yeah, yeah. good. Thanks, you. Good journey. Yeah. Yeah. Andy, what do you reckon to that? Yeah, it's very good for the first attempt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, rivet's pretty good. Yeah. And it's oh, kicking oh, out oh, at oh, an oh, angle. Oh, Narrow there. And then it goes very wide there. Yeah, I like that Flat there. Stick him in the ground, boys. <laughs> That's really brilliant. Are you happy with it? That's the most important oh, thing. I'm very yeah, happy yeah, with yeah. it. You so are happy. Just... Are you the one with the eye? Where's Jill? Are you happy with that, Jill? Absolutely, yeah. Actually, they work. I think it's great, is that? Useful and beautiful. We're really yeah. pleased with that. It's lovely. It's lovely, lovely, lovely. Yeah. <laughs> we started the week making the nail, and then two weeks later, we're making these flambos, and you think, well, OK, I wouldn't necessarily be able to remember how to do that by myself, but I've had a whole range of skills that I can now go away and build on. So if we can have another couple of weeks' worth of exposure to all kinds of stuff, that's a really good starting point. And then talking to this lot, just fabulous. It's a really nice family to be part of. I've come up to Humberside for my second visit to the trainees at the Forge, and I've heard good things, that they're very excited, they're very motivated, and they've been making some really interesting stuff. And one trainee has some particularly exciting news. Now I just want to be a blacksmith. When did that moment hit you? About halfway through the first week. I don't want to sound cheesy, but I, I thought this is meant to be. Yeah. 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 Well, I can see by the way you're speaking it meant to be. So we're, we're at the halfway stage, effectively. Yeah, they're at the halfway stage. Mm. Um, the progress has been varied. Take them one by one. Right, we'll take Dominic first, because Dominic shows the most promise of any of them. He's enthusiastic, he's got the aggression that you need, and he's confident. What about the other two? Well, we'll take Hugh first of all. Okay. He actually is a perfectionist, I think. And he tries very, very hard to get things as perfect as he can. One might think, if someone said he tries his best all the time to get as perfect as he can, as a glowing tribute, but from the tone in your voice and what I'm reading between the lines, you're seeing that as a real fault. It's a fault because he's spending too much time bashing the metal about. And as a consequence of that, he's kind of torturing the iron. And finally, Jill. Jill is a totally different kettle of fish, really. She's improved dramatically, but her level is still well below the level of the guys. Don may be right about this, but I want to get Jill's take on the last couple of weeks. So first thing is, is how's it been? How's, what's the experience been like? Um, bits of it have been terrific. Mm -hmm. 
bits of it. It's no fun being bottom of the class all the time. Are you bottom of the class? Yeah, I think so. It's hard being female in a male environment to a certain extent because you don't want concessions. Mm. Um, and you don't want to let down the rest of the female population by being a girly whinger. Maybe by just indulging in you and blacksmithing and just let it happen on your terms, maybe the blacksmithing would, do, would benefit too. Just watch she step down okay. here because it's a little bit slippy. It's been a pretty relentless period, but Don has now lined up a really exciting surprise for us. Oh, an allotment too. Oh, yes. I like that. You like We're going to do yeah. something which is completely outside my experience, which is attempting to extract iron from rock. Don has recruited Dr. Jerry McDonnell, a specialist in pre industrial smelting techniques, and he'll oversee the process. Meet Monty. Jerry, nice to meet you. Hi, hi. Nice to meet you. I gather you're smelting. Yes, yes. Right. Inside the furnace, iron ore, which is lumps of metallic rock, is heated in layers with burning charcoal, which can reach temperatures of 1,500 degrees centigrade. Now, the metallic iron, because it only melts at 1,584 degrees Celsius, is not liquid. All the other metals used in antiquity, yeah. copper, tin, yeah. lead, yeah. would have flown out of here because they melt. Yeah. Iron is totally different because couldn't, they couldn't melt it. And because it can't be melted by charcoal, the end result is a terrifyingly hot lump of iron and rock impurities called a bloom. I mean, you can see this great grey cauliflower. That's, that's bloom there. That's it. That's, that's it. a big lump there. Can somebody try and get that out? Well, I think there it comes. Comes. he's got it. How yeah, about that's that? The fella. That's the fella. Yeah. That's another big lump, I can tell you. Really up to the yeah. Now that yeah, is just yeah, the beginning. Yeah, we now have to somehow transform this unworkable bloom into a lump of pure iron. So when it comes out of the furnace, then it has to be reheated yeah. in order yeah. to have yeah. Yeah. By reheating the bloom to 1,200 degrees in the forge, the impurities, but not the iron, will melt and then can be squeezed to the surface and forced out of the metal. How will we know when it's ready? Well, what we'd expect to see is it, it, it slowly changing shape. And, uh, and effectively the smith starting to control that shape. That's a better heat. This is the 20th time that Jerry has done this experiment and only succeeded once before, so it's all a bit of a gamble. If Don struck the bloom directly with a hammer, it would shatter. So he's using lengths of wood to soften the hammer blows. After an hour of hammering and squeezing the impurities from the bloom, Don's blacksmithing skills take over, and he thinks he's finally found some metal. So that now is sounding really metallic. Well, you can see the slag coming out of it, and that seems to have left us with a fairly consolidated piece of so material. So how do you know? There. The acid test. OK. <laughs> if sparks fly, we'll know he's struck iron. Fantastic! Yeah. <laughs> I caught it on the tongs. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely iron. Yeah. So well done, that man. Oh, yeah. I'm totally gobsmacked, <laughs> I have to say. I didn't believe it. <laughs> yeah, didn't. No, I didn't. <laughs> I'm starting to lose belief at one stage. Don will now take this small piece of metal, known as a billet, and continue working it to try and remove all the remaining impurities, leaving behind just pure iron. I think everybody in the room felt they were in on something special on that. And part of that is because, truthfully, I don't think we really, really thought the magic was going to happen. And it was there. There was this nugget in there, and playing with it, cajoling it, forming it, really special. I mean, alchemy is, is, is a cliche, but it is alchemy. It was turning stone into metal. It doesn't get much more magical than that, does it? After three weeks based around intensive hammering, Don now introduces the trainees to a more delicate blacksmithing skill, basic repousse, which enables them to create three-dimensional shapes that can be used for purely ornamental work, like leaves. So far, it's been quite heavy stuff. This is much more delicate. I love doing this, the leaves and the nature stuff but I would love to do it about eight feet tall. I would love to do big stuff. 
The last skill they need to be introduced to is the art of fire welding, which involves fusing two pieces of white hot metal together to become one. No modern welding tool can replicate this. It can only be done by hand by a skilled blacksmith. Lots of blacksmiths I know are not able to do that. Yeah. It's too difficult. The trainees have to take the metal almost to the point of burning, 1,200 degrees, which is the right temperature for fire welding. I just know it's bloody hot. <laughs> and it's a white heat that sparkles. It's all done by the eyes. It doesn't matter what temperature it is, just the eyes. You see it, you do it. The margin of error is minute. Too hot and the metal will burn, too cold and the weld won't hold. They've now been introduced to all the basic skills a blacksmith apprentice would acquire after a year in college. Well, this week we've done some quite good exercises. They've all kept together and they've all kept up with each other. Jill maybe is a little bit slower, but nevertheless she's practising all the time and she's getting better. And hopefully next week we can continue and uh, show a bit more progress. A lot of modern blacksmithing work involves restoration and conservation. And for Don, it's no different, with over 70% of his and his team's work consisting of restoring old and often very intricate ironwork. Right, you'll notice that there are some railings here. Mm -hmm. Yes, bad nick. They're These are the John Burrell Arms Houses in, in York, which are one of his current restoration Super projects. Right. This is badly manufactured material. This has only been here since about 1930, which is ridiculous, really, when you think that it should have lasted for hundreds of years. Some railings produced before 1945 were made from an inferior quality wrought iron and are very susceptible to rust and erosion. You can see areas where this delamination is taking place. Yeah, it explodes, basically, yeah. You're going to make some of these components to go back into these panels and you've got three days to do it, and if these are good enough components, they will be included in the panel that's going to be put back here. So, But if not, they'll be scrapped. So back at the Ferriby Forge, the trainees start their first professional job, the Arms House Restoration. In a few days' time, Don's head foreman, Andy, will decide whether their work is good enough to go into the restored railing. and I've still got that bloody flat. Jill is replicating two damaged scrolls from the middle. Hugh has been given two bolt-end scrolls to copy from the top. And Dominic has been charged with making some new leaves. Now I'm trying to measure up the piece that I'm working on uh, and compare it to the original. But it's not as straightforward as that because a lot of the original was missing. Hugh has failed to leave enough material at the end of his scroll which makes it impossible to create the snub which forms the heart of it. Whilst Hugh has produced a product like this in the past, he just seems to have completely lost it and hasn't a clue what he's doing. And he can't grasp the essence of what we're trying to achieve. Jill's um, improved quite a bit. Today, I've noticed that her hammer technique is better than it was. She's actually getting fairly accurate with the hammer. The trainees have just 24 hours in which to complete their work. It's been 10 days since I last visited the forge, and I'm intrigued to find out how the group are coping with the pressures of working unaided on their first professional job. Because today that's going to be assessed. And of course, it'll be judged by professional standards. And it doesn't matter how hard they've worked or how much progress they've made individually. Either it's going to be good enough or it won't be. I'm quite surprised. In fact, I'm astounded by the results. 
Hugh seems to have completely lost it altogether. Really? Yeah. He's just gone absolutely pear shaped. Jill is improving all the time, and so she's actually probably got up to a similar standard to Hugh, and which is really good. And a week ago, one would not have put any money on that. No, not at all. No. no. It's time for Don's head foreman, Andy, to cast his professional eye over their work. If you look at where that's coming in, yeah. you've got your, your angled piece there. If that, yeah. It's that bit, that bit you need to come out more. So that line follows all the way around. Right round. But that is a close. If you look at that one and then look at one of the heavier ones, you can see it's, it's completely different round here in it, the thickness. His snub doesn't look very good either. No, I'm struggling with him. I really am struggling with him. With a little bit of work, I could use this one. All right. Hugh's scrolls are next. I think this is your best one, but it's just getting more material there to make the snub slightly bigger. Okay. And lastly, Dominic's leaves. Out of all four of them, I can use that one. <laughs> Right. Um, if you look down here, the lines, the lines and everything are flowing down there nicely. It just matches very well. You will see yourself at different levels, but the brutal hard fact is that Dominic made one leaf that could be used, you made one that's almost there, and you made one that's almost there and can be modified. In other words, the difference between the three of you is not very great. How do you feel about that? <laughs> <clears throat> Surprised. No, it's good actually to hear that. Maybe you're better than you think you are. Yes. Maybe I am. Yeah. It's serious? a good result for everybody yeah. and an opportune moment for a word of wisdom from their mentor. You start off with this process and you actually improve for a period of time. And then you get to the stage where you disimprove because you're thinking about too many different processes and you go through hell trying to get it right. But then, if you persevere and say, I'm going to crack this, I'm going to bloody well do it, then you go for it. And then all of a sudden, one morning, it'll just click like that. And you'll never, ever forget how to do it again. Dominic, Jill and Hugh are almost at the end of their course. And it's time now for them to take on their final and biggest challenge. Now, an Englishman's home is his castle, and it doesn't matter if it's a socking great palace or a humble terrace house, it all needs a front gate, or at least it used to, because it does seem that increasingly people don't bother with a gate. And if they do get round to putting one in, they go and buy one off the shelf. But in the past, of course, gates were made by blacksmiths, so for this final project, we're going to see if we can excite the local community to care about handcrafted gates. And to that end, we put an ad in the local paper. Right, we're going to select three people, and each of you are going to make them a front gate. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and you start tomorrow morning. <laughs> With the clock ticking, the first thing the trainees do is meet their clients. So this is where you want the gate? This is it, yeah. This building dates from the 1700s, so we're looking for something that would fit in really well with um, with how it would have looked at about that time. Right, yeah. But you don't want anything that's going to be too modern that's going to stand out screaming, look at me. <laughs> Are you both into the local history? Um, or is it mostly...? I am, but mostly Darren it's is. It's mostly yeah. you. I just tag along. <laughs> <laughs> I like this rose that you've got, that's lovely. OK, I'm going to put yeah. them next beside these elements. What else did you say? I like crosses. OK, yeah. good. Very good, particularly this close that, yeah. yeah. That can make for a really interesting feature, actually. Absolutely. Well, I think so, but I'm kind of biased. <laughs> <laughs> when they've worked out their designs, the trainees must now transfer them onto a template on the floor which are inside frames that are being made for them by Don's company. After talking to his client, Hugh has decided on an allegorical theme based on her life. So the idea is that this warrior, obviously in the, in the forest to try and save some princess in distress, was lured by the devil's helper who got caught in the spider's web and is now captured and being carried through the forest in the web on the back of the devil. 
Hugh's bitten off far more than he can chew. I fail to see how he's possibly going to get it done in the time. So I don't know where he's coming from, really, on that. Dominic is evolving his three-dimensional gate idea. I've got five bars coming down. Mm -hmm. Are you going to do your uh, dragon's head? Oh, I think so. It's the only gate in Barton with a dragon's head. <laughs> <laughs> it wants to be different. And Jill has finally found inspiration in local nature. Her design incorporates bulrush leaves, all of which will have to be individually forged. For a week, the trainees hammer, bend and shape the elements of their designs, including the roots, birds, dragon's heads and bulrushes. I need to heat it up and take that in a wee bit more. But with the deadline rapidly approaching, Don is worried that the trainees haven't grasped the magnitude of the work still to be done. I'm trying to instill upon you yeah. that you're doing a commercially viable project. Yeah. Speed is of the essence. Get it bloody done. A bit of motivation and a bit of power. It's a completely different feeling, uh, and the pressure's definitely on. You know, there's, there's nothing easy about this. It's the afternoon before the gates are to be judged and Dominic is beginning the final stage of constructing his, which is riveting his design into its frame. Just time to find something glaringly obvious wrong with it. Hugh is still making parts for his gate and is nowhere near finishing. It's really, really beautiful. I didn't think it would come out that well. But it's coming out really super. I mean, that's not finished yet, but it's almost there. Do you see it? You need to stop pissing about with little bits. Oh, no, no more pissing Get about. cracking on with it. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? He's not worried about anything. <laughs> We're going to stop working at midnight, but the pressure of having to get the job done doesn't seem to be affecting him at all, unless he's bottling it all up inside and he's going to explode at a minute to midnight. I don't know. <laughs> I'll come back for that. It could be a laugh. <laughs> Last few adjustments. The others are finished. But Hugh's ambitious design has left him with very little time to assemble it. Seriously up against it, he works on into the night. Well, it's judgment day. And the important thing is that each of the trainees can show themselves off to their very best. Now, I'm sure they don't know what that is. I certainly don't. And I also hear that Hugh may not be able to show anything at all, because although he's done a lot of work, up until last night, at least, it was all still in pieces on the floor. Hugh, how are you doing? Hey, how are you doing? I'm fine. You've obviously been doing something amazing. Let me have a look. It's extraordinary, you know? <laughs> it's, it's amazing. I like it. To be honest, I'm so surprised that I'm having to take it in. Yeah. I think it's fantastic. Thank you. Does it feel good enough? I mean, you're happy with it. But... I'm delighted with it. Whatever happens from now on, I think I've got something that I can be very proud of. Very good. Hi, Dom. You've got that body language of a man who's in a hurry. <laughs> Why was you that impression? <laughs> That's an amazing gate. The client said they didn't want too many scrolls in it, which is one thing, so I, I reduced the scrolls. They were happy with the dragons. I had a dragon's latch to start with, so that's the head as well. Got a little eye there. Oh, yeah. Um, I think the client will be happy with it because it, fit, it suit fits their criteria. Are you happy with that? I am. I'm astonished, actually. I keep looking at that and thinking, did I do this? <laughs> do you know what? Looking at you, you look different. I feel different. Do you? Yeah. You do. You really look... Something's gone from your face. I think something's back, actually. I've gone from black and white to being back in colour. Colour? I have. Well, I mean, what I was going to say is the worry's gone. <laughs> the, the, the sort of anxiety is gone. <laughs> well, that's allowed. You're allowed to be tired. <laughs> on a personal level, it's exhilarating to see how that they've drawn on resources and skills they certainly didn't know that they had six weeks ago. Dom has come up with something that expresses his passion, and Hugh has resolved that problem between sculpture and craft, and Jill, Jill's just found herself. That's wonderful in itself. But whether the judge will enjoy them as much as I have, whether the clients will like them, we don't know. And, of course, one of them has got to be picked as a winner. Now it's exciting. <laughs> no. Right, right, this way. 
But it's not only the clients that these gates need to impress. Bob Hobbs is the fourth only blacksmith ever to be awarded a gold medal by the Worshipful Company of Blacksmiths in their 700-year history. And he's arrived to judge their work. So I suppose you have to see how it works as well as That's how right. it's made. Yes, yeah. we do. Right, so now this is the moment of truth. It, it opens wow. and closes. <laughs> yes. It swings very nicely. It does, yes. It swings yes. very nicely indeed. Yeah. He will judge the gates according to the strict criteria used in blacksmithing competitions, which include balance and proportion, quality of finish, technical skill, and originality of design. Ian, Leslie, would you like to come and see your gate? I'd love to. Well, here we are. So Very what, good. What's your reaction? Well, we did say we didn't want anything that came off a production line, and I don't well, think that so many has scrolls, done. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's right, but we said we wanted something a bit different. You specifically wanted dragons, did you? No, we didn't no. ask for dragons. No, Dom, Dom, no. Dominic, Dominic had the, yeah, had the mm. idea. Right. We said something substantial and something that fitted with the period of the house. Uh, how, how does that fit that brief? I don't think it does fit that brief. It's whether, it's, again, you know, again, going back to how you feel about something. Can you live with something? Yeah. Does it feel right? And it doesn't feel wrong. It's a bespoke gate. Yeah, it's not like any other. It isn't. That's, That's right. right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now it's on to Jill's gate, and Bob seems to be impressed with it. Everything falls in rather nicely. She's got good choice of materials. Done well. The, the whole gate is is simplicity in itself, and it all works well. How do you react to that? I'm really pleased. That's good. lovely. You're very, very, very pleased, yes, aren't I you? Am. Yeah, that's yes, good. Good for you. Pleased. You'd better come outside to see it from the front, because it has a front. And it's beautiful. It's really, really beautiful. It's really, really beautiful. Absolutely really beautiful. beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. It is really beautiful. Yes, it is. And lastly, as the rain starts to fall in earnest, Hugh. Oh, wow. I love it. Is, oh, it, is it what you thought it would be? It's better. Is I, it? I like the rose. Oh, it's fantastic. I love it. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel? Oh, I feel um, elated, completely elated. I love it. It's brilliant. Good. Well, that's a good that's a result, isn't it? That's a good <laughs> customer. Seeing those gates in situ completes the process. Very difficult to judge which is the best, that's not my job, but I can work out which I like best. And I'm surprised by that, because I've ended up liking Jill's gate best. And I never thought that would happen, because I didn't think she was in a place to make something that would be pleasing. But the more you look at it, the more satisfying it is. So there we are, I've, I've set my flag, I want Jill to win, and that's unprofessional. The trainees have all learned a huge amount, but now just one of these gates will be singled out by Bob, who spent a lifetime mastering the craft that they've just entered upon. So, Bob, I think if you could explain the merits and faults of each individual gate as you saw it, and then which one you'd like to choose. All right, yeah. To me, he didn't appeal so much because of your vertical bars standing out of balance, and Jill, your latch, which is your moving piece, you just want that tightened up to just to put it right. But other than that, he was spot on. Coming to you, Hugh, you, uh, your roses could have been pushed up together a bit tighter. But when you got it up together, I thought, wow, what lovely balance. Anyway, at the end of the day, uh, I, I put you down as first. So, well, Hugh, you won. <laughs> Good lad. <laughs> Good lad. <laughs> and uh, I put I put Jill down as second. Thank you. And um, I, and I put you down as third. No worries. I give you the figures if you like. Yours was sixty out of a hundred, and Jill was fifty-seven, and, uh, and and yours was fifty-three. <laughs> A blacksmith's apprentice, after a whole year at college, would do well to achieve a 60% score on a test like this. So the group's results are genuinely impressive. It's nice and warm in here. <laughs> and finally, Don has one more surprise for us. 
Shut up, please. <laughs> Listen to your master. <laughs> you may remember that there was a little piece of billet that I forged out of the smelter that we did, and I said I would refine it. I did that, and I've brought you all a little piece of that billet, <laughs> which is pure iron. Oh, my God. Thank you. That's, That's one of the nicest things I've ever been given. It is. Not to leave you it's out, Monty. Oh, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> thank you. You seem to be very moved by that. It represents the six weeks where my life has done a 360. You know, I thought it was, I was too late in life to be able to change direction and start something new. But now I've seen that I can, and it is a wonderful feeling. You see, you look different. I feel different. It's so interesting. Yeah. Well, that's because somebody yeah. opened the door on the world again and let all the fresh air in. I'm delighted to have one. I've done this because um, what I was doing before didn't give me a, a good life. I didn't feel I was, you know, living the life that I, I wanted to live. And I suppose I didn't transfer that to my family. But I hope, since I'm enjoying doing what I'm going to be doing, that I'll enjoy them and we'll all enjoy each other better. So the validation of somebody who has every credit, cr credential and, and you can't help but respect yeah. is really necessary. And I have somebody who, who's, who's recognised as, as, as the best in, in, in England. To have that recognition, that's, that's like being knighted. Arise, Sir Hugh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I hadn't realised that, that winning this was so important to Hugh. And clearly, because he's won, it is going to change things for him. So that not only have they started this process of getting to grips with a difficult craft, and not only are their lives going to change, but I do believe that this experience has changed them as people, too. Next time, we're heading to church to introduce a full-time mother, a trainee architect, and a grandmother to the ancient craft of stained glass. It is not going to be easy, but there is no way will I fail at stained glass. And while I explore its venerable history, they will struggle to master the exquisite delicacies of the raw material. If I could actually use this skill as a new way of making money in my life, I would love it.